All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining me on this very special episode of 13 Motorsports. In this episode, I'm gonna teach you how to weld. And we're gonna cover the two most common forms of welding. We're gonna go with MIG welding and with TIG welding. Stay tuned. All right, you guys, I don't want this video to be too long, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split it into two parts. In the first part, we're gonna cover the basic differences between a TIG and a MIG machine, some of the differences in equipment, and we're also going to cover some of the personal safety equipment they use. And in the second part of the video, we're gonna transition into the actual welding itself between both machines. Okay, so first off, a little disclaimer. I like to point out that I am not a professional welder. I do not do this for a living. I do not have any certifications. Everything I'm gonna teach you today is just stuff I have picked up through the years of teaching myself. But again, I do ride motorcycles that have my welds on them. I put my life on the line for them. I trust my welds, so there is something to that. All right, so I'd like to cover what equipment I have first. Uh, first off, this is my Lincoln. This is an Easy MIG 140 MIG welder. So this is designed, it's a 110 volt welder, so it's designed to just plug into any regular wall outlet. You don't need a 220 volt setup on there. Now that does come with limitations, okay? There's a maximum thickness of weld you can do with this sort of machine. But for the type of work that I like to do, I do not usually exceed 3 16th inch thick metal, and that's about the maximum capability of this. So this was a good fit for me. So let's go over some of the features of it. If you're going to be looking for a welder of any kind, I know there's a lot of Chinese options out there right now, but I do think it is worth the extra money to go with a name brand model. You can find ones that aren't really that expensive. Uh, maybe find a used one that works. I, I really do think there's a difference when you buy the name brand stuff. Um, not to mention just parts availability. If something goes out, you can buy just the parts that you need versus the Chinese ones where you pretty much have to just buy a whole nother unit. The gas you use in a MIG, well, what I use is 7525. That's 75% argon, 25% CO2. Now the gas you use in a TIG is different. The TIG is 100% argon, so you will have to have separate tanks between a TIG and a MIG welder. So that is one thing to think about. All right, so let's go over some of the specifics and differences of the different machines. And being a MIG, it just has this gun style that the wire comes right out the tip there and the shielding gas comes right around around. So it's just one, one easy thing. You got your trigger here, easy trigger pull. The rest of the machine itself is really simple. I mean, basically you've got your ground here that you attach to your workpiece. And then how do you set it up? Well, it's pretty cool. You open up the flap here. So this is your wire. I'm running uh, 030, so 30 thousandths wire, solid core wire. And what's really nice is that these welders come with a really handy, basically table or diagram to show you, you know, okay, so this is your thickness of metal that you're trying to weld. Well, this is the actual kind of welding we're doing right here. What size wire are we using? Well, we're using 030. So let's say if I'm trying to weld 3 16 wire, welding 030, I should have it on D, the range D, which is the heat range right there. And wire speed should be on five. So it's pretty close to where I have it now. I've got it just a little bit below that. But it's nice, it really takes the guesswork out of it for you. That's why it's called an easy MIG. There's not a whole lot to this setup. And again, you can start to learn how to do this very quickly. The advantage of a MIG is that it's much, much faster and much easier to pick up than the TIG welding, but there are some limitations to it as well, and we'll cover those in a bit. Okay, so one of the questions I get asked a lot is, what welder should I buy? Should I go cheap? Should I go expensive? What should I do? And my advice uh, with my experience is, get the absolute best machine that you can afford right off the bat. And why do I say that? Well, the inferior machines, well, the lesser priced ones, I should say, many times they have a real lack of adjustability. And because of that, you can struggle, especially when you're first learning how to weld and it's very discouraging and it'll kind of put you off on welding and you can think, well, I just don't know how to do this. And you just get discouraged and you say, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Whereas if you buy the more higher end machines, they have more capabilities and they kind of make you feel like a hero right off the bat. And then you improve from there. 
but right off the bat you can start seeing good improvement and it gives you confidence to think hey I can do this and trust me you can do this welding is really not that difficult once you really get a feel for it and a lot of it is just seat time just spend as much time welding as you can and you'll get there eventually Usually one of the other comments I get when people are trying to get into welding, they ask me, well, should I get a gas welder or should I get a flux core welder? Now, what's the difference? Well, a flux core welder, the wire itself has a shielding gas built into it that it needs to protect the weld. And the gas welder, it has the gas separate. So you're running a solid core wire and then the gas just kind of flows around it to protect the weld. I always say, if you can at all possible, go with the gas welding do not go with the flux core wire welder why well the flux core makes a gigantic mess i mean it splatters absolutely everywhere and i don't like the way the weld looks yes you can get a decent weld if you know what you're doing and technically you can get a deeper penetration with the flux core well wire welder than you can with just the solid core wire but in my mind the trade-off isn't worth it Flux core is effective if you're using it for something that no one's ever going to see that weld or it's an industrial type of deal. But in my applications, when you're doing metal fabrication, well, people are gonna see those welds and I want them to look at least halfway decent when they're looking at them. So I prefer a solid core with a gas uh, setup. Yes, it does cost more money that way, but I think in the end you'll be happier and your progress will be a lot faster as well. There's a few different settings on there with your dial. Uh, basically, I only use two. I, I use all the way over here to the right for just regular steel, and then all the way over to the left when I'm doing my aluminum. So it keeps it pretty simple there. And then down here, you have your amperage switch, which basically is just a rotary dial, and that's kind of a trial and error feel kind of thing. You just need to play with it a bit and figure out what's the best position while you're welding a certain thickness steel. That way next time around you know where to go to. All right, so the TIG machine is a little bit different and there's a few more options there. And I'd like to go over just the torch to begin with. All right, so the torch is this guy right here. So you got a couple different ends there. I mean, you got the end piece here, you got the cup and then the torch itself. Some of these are water cooled, but we'll not go into that right now. Um, and then you have your tungsten right here in the end, sticking out the end there. So. There's a bunch of different options you can do with these torches, okay? There's, there's like little cap ends here that just stop right there. And basically that's to make it smaller so you can fit in tighter areas so you cut your tungsten down. Uh, and then there's a multitude of different cups, okay? We got a cup like that. Smaller cup there. Another cup here, it's a lot larger. So really, what's the difference between all of these? Well, a lot of them are designed so that you can fit maybe in smaller areas, tighter areas, that sort of thing. Why do I have this gigantic cup on the end of mine? Well, I'm using what's called a gas lens, okay? A gas lens, it's very important. So in the standard cup, like say this one here, see that's just straight through there? So basically in the standard cup, the gas flows in out of the torch and it just kind of surrounds the tungsten and it kind of flows outward but it does so in a very uneven pattern, that sort of thing. And it's hard to get good coverage. Well, when you have a gas lens, you can kind of see inside there, there's a little grid pattern in there. And what that does, the gas flows out in a very, very even pattern and it covers more. What does that allow you to do? Well, it allows you to really stick the tungsten out a considerable distance. Now that's not really, you know, you probably shouldn't put it out that far but it allows you to get into some really acute angles and that sort of thing. So I love a gas lens. I really, I, I encourage anyone who's doing any sort of TIG welding to get a gas lens and to start welding with that. But what about the tungsten itself, the metal inside there? There's a lot of different options there as well. There's this eighth inch sized tungsten here. There's a 1 16th sized tungsten here, itty bitty. And what I have in here right now is the 330 seconds tungsten. I recommend the 330 seconds tungsten because it's the most universal out of all of them. You can do quite a variety of different thicknesses of metal with the 330 seconds. The others have their uses in specific applications, but really for all around use, 330 seconds has been the best for me. Okay, so also with the TIG machine, you have your foot pedal here. And the foot pedal is what's really nice because with the MIG, 
your voltage or your amperage is your amperage. It is what it is. There's no changing it. With a foot pedal and a TIG, you can really modulate the heat and really slow down, speed up, any of that sort of thing. And that's one of the real big advantages of a TIG machine. All right, you guys, so I want to talk for a couple of minutes about the advantages and disadvantages of either MIG welding or TIG welding. People ask me all the time, which is better, which is better? That's the wrong question to ask. They both do the exact same thing. They're both welders. You're both fusing metal together. It's just that some work better in some situations and the other works better in another. So for example, if you're welding something and there's a lot of welding to be done on it and you need it to be done in a short period of time, the MIG welder is fantastic at that. You can go ahead and just zip, 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 zip it all up. No problem at all. The welds may not be quite as fancy looking, but it doesn't matter because you're just trying to get it done like a building trailer or something like that. Just knock it out with a MIG, done deal. Don't have to think about it. The TIG takes forever. Okay, it does. It, it just, it, it takes a long time to do just a nice, neat little weld with a TIG, but it looks spectacular. So if you have something that you know the welds are going to be visible in a small area, the TIG is really, really nice for that. Also, the MIG welder, you can tell it has a fair amount of splatter to it, especially if you go with flux core. It's going to splatter absolutely everywhere. It makes a mess. I hate it. The TIG is clean. You're not going to get that spatter, especially if you've got your metal nice and clean and everything like that. It's, it's super clean. You barely even have to hit that thing with a wire brush. It's another reason why I like to TIG very much. Downside to the TIG, you're going to use a bunch more gas than you do with the MIG. The MIG, my 80 cubic foot bottle there, can last for probably a couple of months. I can go through several spools of wire on the same gas bottle. The TIG, now it varies because it depends on how much you're going to be using it, but if I'm using the TIG steady, you know, five, six hours for two or three days straight, I can empty that bottle pretty fast. Now, the reason for that is because a TIG welder has what's called post flow on it, okay? Because every single time you hit that pedal, the, when the gas starts flowing, as soon as you let off the pedal, my particular welder is non-adjustable in the post flow. Most of the newer ones are adjustable. Mine is non-adjustable. I get 10 seconds of post flow after I finish a weld. So 10 full seconds. The reason for that is because after you finish a weld when you're TIG welding, they want you to hold the torch over it to help protect that weld with that gas until it cools a little bit. If you immediately pull the torch away when you're done welding, chances are you can contaminate the end of your weld. So unfortunately, 10 seconds is rather excessive in my mind um, of post flow. So every single time you hit that pedal, including when you accidentally bump it, which happens all the time, now you got 10 seconds of gas flowing out the end of the torch. So you definitely use a lot more gas when you're TIG welding than when you're MIG welding. So that's a downside. Also to, again, as I mentioned, how slow it is. It is very slow. It's hard to actually get a big area accomplished. Another thing I mentioned earlier, it's, it can be more difficult to tack things with a TIG welder than it can be with a MIG. If your fitment is really good, then no, it's not an issue because you can tack it rather easily. If your fitment's not quite as good, yeah, it takes a lot more work and it's easier just to have a MIG. You can just hold the part in place and zap, zap, it's on there. Okay, so for just a couple of minutes, I wanna talk about the kind of equipment you're going to need when you're welding. First off, most obvious, you're gonna need a welding hood, right? You're gonna need a mask of some sort. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely go with the auto darkening style that pretty much everyone has nowadays. There is literally no reason to go with the old flip down, flip up style of welding helmet. That is completely archaic, it's in the past. It will not help you to improve, advance, anything, okay? You can get one of the auto darkening helmets from Harbor Freight for as little as $35, and it actually works pretty well. I used a Harbor Freight helmet for a couple of years at least, and it was fine. It was fine, it, it got me going, and it was good enough. Um, it is nice to kind of step up to one of the better ones. You know, reason being, you can see a lot better before you've actually started your arc. So you can kind of see where you're at, make sure you're starting in the right spot, that sort of thing. I value that when I'm welding. I want to have as clear a view as possible before I begin the arc. Uh, so a better helmet is good for that. This particular one happens to be a Lincoln brand one, but you don't have to go super high end with one of these. Even the one from Napa that's around 150 bucks, I wanna say, 
That one actually works really well. I like it a lot. Uh, I really like the transition. It, it works fantastic. In fact, <clears throat> mine, even though it costs a little bit more, it actually, the batteries in it died uh, about a year ago after about five years worth of use. And there's no way to actually change the batteries in these things. They're, they're built into the circuit board itself. But YouTube to the rescue. I found a guy on there who made a video about opening up the circuit board, unsoldering the original wires, soldering in different wires so you can run external batteries. So that's exactly what I did. I wired in some external batteries in this thing and it works great. And it only cost me about six bucks to do it instead of buying a whole new hood. So that worked out well. So next up, gloves. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen people wearing these kind of gloves or that have these kind of gloves. You know what these are fantastic for? These are really good for if you're welding a battleship in a shipyard or something like that. Really not so good for much of anything else at all, especially not while you're welding. These have, they're just, I mean, they're great because they're so thick and strong. You, you don't feel too much heat through them and <clears throat> you can grab something that's just been welded, anything like that. But the problem is you have almost no feel with something like this, almost none. And when you're welding, feel is really critical. So I, I really despise these type of gloves. I'll wear them every now and then if I'm welding something extremely hot or something like that. But that sure doesn't happen often. I had a pair of um, TIG welding specific leather gloves for a while and I really liked them. They were very flexible, had a lot of feel. Uh, unfortunately, I wore them too much while I was doing a lot of metal grinding and stuff and that eventually wore away at the cloth parts of it. And so those, those gloves are no longer. But a lot of times when I'm welding, I'm not wearing gloves at all beyond just these, you know, rubber, latex, whatever they are, gloves that I'm wearing now. Uh, many times you can get away with that. And I like it because again, you have to have that feel. It's a very tactile thing, especially when you're TIG welding, to be able to know exactly where you are and just dab, dab, dab. I don't like welding with big, thick gloves. Next up, uh, you may not know this, you may know this, but when you're welding, the welding flash is very intense. In fact, it basically gives you a sunburn if you have any exposed skin. You may even see that on this channel from time to time. I, I might have a t-shirt burn from here down during the summertime because I'm not very good about that. I shouldn't let myself burn like that, but I do. But it's very intense. So if you have any exposed skin, try to cover it up. Um, one thing I do have is I have these welding sleeves. Basically, they just pull on if you're wearing a t-shirt or something, you just slide them onto your arm. They're a very thick material. <clears throat> they protect you from any kind of welding slag while you're MIG welding, and they protect your arms just from the UV light and so they don't get sunburned. Um, I like them. I think they actually work really well and I try to wear them when I remember them. Another good thing to have is a wire brush. Uh, this one has kind of seen its day. It's a little bit done for. But it's important to have one of these so you can clean it all up when you're done welding. Um, an important note though is that you don't want to use the same wire brush when you're going to different metals. Like don't use the same one for mild steel as you use for stainless as you use for aluminum. Keep them separate. Otherwise they'll contaminate each other and that does make a difference. All right you guys, so I got another tip for you and this is regarding the ground clamp. Now of course you need to have your workpiece grounded whether you're working with MIG or TIG otherwise you were unable to start welding. But really this is a cautionary tale when it comes to TIG specifically. So a little anecdote for you. I was working on a motorcycle frame that I was building and I had the engine that I was going to use sitting in the frame and the starter was attached and the starter cable was cut and it was just laying against the frame. Well, I went to start the arc on that and it started turning the engine over. Rawr, 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 rawr. I could not believe it because if you guys know how much power it takes to actually turn an engine over, it was amazing that it was sending that much current through the frame that it could do that. But it makes sense when you think about it because you're turning metal into a molten pool. So it's going to take quite a bit of current to do that. So where am I going with this? Well, make sure you're grounding your workpiece before you're starting to arc because in TIG specifically, if you do not ground it and you happen to be touching the workpiece in a way, it's going to use you as the ground. And believe me, that does not feel good. Always I think about that movie, The Princess Bride, uh, where he's on the machine and he says, oh, I just took away a year of your life. 
That's exactly what it feels like when you get hit with the TIG machine. So make sure that workpiece is grounded because that shock to your heart does not feel good. It's not appreciated. All right, you guys, that does it for the first part of the video on learn how to weld. So far, we've covered the differences between the TIG and the MIG machine and some of the personal safety equipment and also some of the tips that I've learned along the way. In the second half of the video, we're actually gonna delve into the welding itself and a little bit more tips. Stay with me.